is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 183, covering the week of August 19th through August 23rd, 2019. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. If you don't want to search for all those social media accounts, just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org, A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all our social media buttons. While you're there, give us an email address and we will give you a free ebook. And you get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. You can support the Abbeville Institute by going to abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a tab that says support. Click on that. It'll drop down a menu, and you can have donor options. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time donation. Anything you do donate is fully deductible to the, I'm sorry, tax deductible to the full extent of the law, excuse me. And it does help keep the podcast going, the website going, all of our programs, all the things we're doing. So any support you have is greatly appreciated. You can also support the Institute by clicking on that little Amazon icon at the top of the page. That's our Amazon Smile account. We are a recognized 501c3 group for Amazon. So if you shop at Amazon and you want to help us by throwing you a few pennies our way as you shop at Amazon, you can do that. You can also get some of our merchandise under that support tab. You also have a shop button. Click on that and you can go out to our store where you can get your embroidered Abbeville Institute apparel. Golf shirts, t-shirts, hats, golf towels, a lot of great stuff there. Fleece. I know it's uh, it's still hot in the south, but maybe in some other parts of the country. going to start getting cool soon, so you got fleece that you can wear in the fall months, so it's, it's nice. In the south, that'll be just the winter months, right? You get a fleece, and you're good to go. And, of course, don't forget to get our free mobile app. Just go to your mobile app store, wherever you get your mobile applications. Look for Abbeville Institute, download the app, and you got us on the go. Again, free of charge. A great way to keep in touch with the Institute and keep up with what we're doing. All of our lectures, all of our podcasts, all of our articles come through that too. So it's a great way to stay in tune with what the Institute is doing. And it's a great way to help support the Institute as well. All right. All that said, let's talk about the material for the week. One of the things that we're seeing, of course, and we've talked about this quite a bit, is this lack of reconciliation. Um the whole idea of the 1880s, 90s, early 20th century was reconciliation. Once Reconstruction was over, once Reconstruction was over, there was a period where we had reconciliation. And um, that's now completely gone. In fact, what the establishment historians would like to do, I think, is eliminate this whole idea of reconciliation. If you look at what Eric Foner has written for years, Reconstruction was an unfinished revolution. His newest book, of course, is going to push the idea that we ha- that we were remaking America, which is absolutely true during Reconstruction, but it stopped, and we should have continued to do that. And so the 20th century, particularly the last half of the 20th century, and the early 21st century has been about this process again of remaking America. Um, and this is, again, something that if you look at, for example, the New York Times has just come out with a, uh, a new series, 1619, where they're saying that the United States wasn't founded until 1619 when the first African slaves were brought to, uh, North America by the British, or at least, uh, that's when we had, uh, slavery in the British North American colonies. Of course, there were slaves here before that. Uh, There were slaves here in the Spanish colonies long before that. Um, But the the interesting thing about this, and and if you look at, I I pulled up, first of all, all these slaves were treated as indentured servants. There were no laws. They were treated as indentured servants. Um, And uh, and it wasn't until the 1640s that you had slave codes established in Massachusetts in the 1660s in Virginia. And there was a, I was looking at, I think it was the NPR, or maybe it was the National Park Service, one of these groups. And um, they said, well, the first slaves were brought here, they were treated as indentured servants. But then shortly thereafter, they were they were treated as slaves. Shortly thereafter, 20 to 40 years? That's a lifetime in the colonial period. 40 years. The average lifespan was about 40 years. 
45, 50 years. It's a lifetime before this thing started, before there were, there, there were any type of slave codes. And the other thing about that, of course, is that the first case of legal lifetime bondage in Virginia was an African enslaving another African. So uh, all that complexity is lost. Uh, the And, of course, if you read anything from this 1619 uh, website, the idea is that somehow Europeans were driving the slave trade, when in fact it was the other way around. Africans were driving the slave trade. Uh, Europeans could not get a foothold anywhere, really, in West Africa, uh, because the African tribes kept them out, and they, they dictated the terms of the slave trade. So, um, and there's a book by Thornton on that. The guy's name is Thornton, and um, he has done a fantastic job pointing out, and, and his, the reason he wrote the book is because he wanted Africans to not be seen as victims, subjects, that they were actually uh, a, an intelligent people who were interested in their own economic well-being, and that economic well-being involved in, this, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, the institution of slavery, even in the 19th century. So, uh, I mean, this is a complex institution. We have an article this week that addresses that issue. But you see, if you bring up this complexity, the whole idea there is actually that's a reconciliationist message. It's saying, look, no one's, this is an institution as old as man itself. No one's, no one people are to blame for this. Um, it's a, it is an institution that has been around in virtually every society in the history of man. Um, the United States is not alone in this. And by saying these things, what you do is you take some of the sting out of it. And yes, there have been some, some issues because of slavery. There's no doubt about that. Um, but when you continually harp on the institution, well, what you're doing is creating um, a conflict situation, us versus them. Uh, if you don't toe the line and say 1619 is a real founding, well, then you're just a pariah. We're you're going to be intellectually ostracized, whatever the case may be. This is unjust because it actually narrows discourse instead of expanding discourse. It actually creates animosity instead of creating reconciliation. And that's the whole point. Uh, reconciliation was an attempt to heal the wounds. And when you look at the reconciliation period, I mean, these are, look, these are people that should hate each other. They shot at each other for four years. They killed each other. They maimed each other. And yet, they were able to shake hands and say, look, let's let bygones be bygones. Let's, uh, let's put this thing behind us and move forward. Horace Greeley, one of the most outspoken abolitionists before the war, was firmly in support of reconciliation because he thought that this continual animosity between the sections was bad for the United States. He thought it was going to produce a situation where they could never move forward, they could never grow, they could never be a prosperous people because of the continued sexual animosity. So go back to real federalism. Let, let, let this, let, let's go back to the real constitution here and not try to dictate terms, have cultural, economic, or political imperialism, which is what Reconstruction was really all about. And so the pieces we have this week are addressing that. The first piece of the week, Boyd Cathy, talks about his political separation in our future. And the simple point of this piece is that we have cultural imperialism again. We are going through another process of reconstruction. You have the uh, radical left and their, and their willing accomplices, in many cases, in the neoconservatives, uh, who write things like John C. Calhoun is the greatest enemy of America. <laughs> Uh, I mean, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, when you, Calhoun was the most br brilliant political philosopher of the day, and he was uh, he was astute. He was actually saying things that would make America in the 21st century. When you look at his legal mind, look, we have to protect minorities, rule the majority. Tyranny the majority is not necessarily the best thing, because that can create all kinds of problems. Uh, the fact that we should have regionalism or state control of issues. I mean, this is something that would actually save Americans from being so angry with each other. Uh, but, I mean, that's no good because we have nationalism. And all, and all uh, Dr. Cathy is saying here is, look, we've got a situation where we have cultural imperialism. One side or the other. If you have the left dominating, it's going to create animosity. If you have the right dominating, it's going to create animosity. So the only way to get around this the only way to get around this is some type of separation, whether it's 
secession, whether it's decentralization, I mean, whether it's regionalism, something has to happen. Something's going to have to give in the future. And this is one of the reasons why the Abbeville Institute was founded. Dr. Livingston, the founder of the, of the organization, has been interested in this idea, is America too big for a long time? Is America too big? Can it function properly with over 320 million people with a, with a Congress that has a representative ratio of 750,000 to 1? Can it, can it function properly? When also you have a situation where um, certain sections or certain groups of people try to dominate culturally against the rest. And of course, this creates tremendous opposition. It creates anger and angst and all kinds of other things. So shouldn't we go back and look at the original Constitution and say, you know, there was a, there was a solution for this. It's called federalism. It's called nullification. It's called decentralization. And last resort, if one side is unwilling to just say, all right, let's live and let live, then it comes down to secession. This is where California has started to talk about it because they don't want to be in a union with Trumpists. And okay. I mean, this is something that um, we should be having these conversations. But no, because America has to be so big and it has to have so much territory and so many things. But what we're looking at is cultural imperialism. It's the same thing that was going on in Reconstruction. It's the same thing Southerners were bristling against during Reconstruction. In some ways, it's the same thing that the North was saying they didn't want Leading up, to re reading, leading up to the war, they were saying that they're being dominated by the slave power. So in their mind, the South was dominating the government. And so uh, they thought that there should be some remedy for that. Well, the South leaves, and they say, you can't do that. <laughs> I mean, that's the funny thing about it. There were abolitionists who actually said, look, great, this is good. We don't have the South in our, the Deep South or any of the South in our union anymore. We don't have to worry about that issue. It's gone. Lysander Spooner, for example, was of that mind. There were others, too who said, look, we, we can't coerce the South. They're out. This is what we wanted. Abolitionists were talking about secession in the 1840s. So what changed? Well, it became an economic and cultural imperialism. So the fact is, we should be having these conversations. And the only remedy, and I remember saying this in the 1990s, uh, I was, at, I was uh, in a conversation with Clyde Wilson and another individual, and I said, look, nullification we should be talking about this again. And this other individual said, no, that'll never work. It's never worked. And, and Clyde said, no, it's worked every time it's been tried. It has. The federal government generally backs down or they lose because the power really is with the states. Um, so we've got a situation with cultural imperialism. And when you look at what the New York Times is trying to do, set an agenda, an antagonistic agenda, not, not, not a reconciliationist agenda, that's the situation. So you look at um, the uh, the last couple of pieces, the last piece of the week. So we, I'm going to bookend these. So the Friday piece is Lee and reconciliation. It talks about Lee's views on reconciliation, what he was willing to do to try to heal the wounds of the war. What he was willing not to do to keep the war going. Or he was unwilling to do, I should say, to keep the war going. He, he was not interested in prolonging the conflict because he thought it was bad again for the Southern people and bad for America. But now Lee is seen as one of the most evil men in American history. This is a man who was magnanimous. This is a man who was humble. This is a man who decided that the best interest of the South was to simply do their duty. He went off and retired, didn't make any money on his name. I mean, this is, an in this is a man who personified the American character. And for decades, over a century... Lee was viewed that way. It's only because of the recent attempts at antagonism that Lee has become such a pariah, uh, that you cannot write anything nice about Robert E. Lee and be, uh, and be accepted by fashionable establishment historians. You just can't do it. And this is unfortunate. This is unjust in reality. Because every man, every individual in, in history has their foils, has their, has their, their faults. But um, the fact is, you have people that would be valuable in our understanding of American history uh, who are simply, or American character, are simply pushed aside because of modern political correctness. And that's what's going on here. 
And John Morcourt talks about this in his uh, issue, this piece, The Psychosis of Slavery, where he again brings this up. Look, every civilization in the history of man has had slavery. This is not an original sin to America. This is an original sin of man to have slavery. I mean, we can't say it's the, it's the American original sin. No, it's not. There was slavery here in North America before the British even got here. There was Indian slaves before African slaves. There were indentured servants before African slaves. White indentured servants. Why are we saying 1619? There were indentured servants before the Africans showed up in 1619. So that's slavery. Now I know, well, that's not really slavery. Yes, it is. You're bonded, you're indentured. You're a slave for, for the time of your indentures. What they're saying is it's not lifelong bondage, but neither were the first Africans who were brought here in 1619. So what's the difference? You see? So yes, there were slaves here before that. I mean, look, and then uh, you look at the history of the world and you have it all over the place. And he points out there's still slavery today. So all the people that are running around in America that are saying, well, if I was, you know, if I, I, I admire John Brown, for example. Well, you could go be John Brown in other parts of the world. You could go be John Brown in parts of Africa or Asia or the Middle East. Uh, or maybe even in Haiti. You could go down to Haiti and try to end the legal status of, children, of child slaves there. But no, because you're an armchair abolitionist, meaning that you're, you're looking back and you say, if I was living in the 1840s, I'd be an abolitionist. But, I mean, there's slavery all over the world now. Why aren't you working to end that? There's human trafficking in the United States today. Why aren't you working to end that? Um, so this is a, look, slavery is as old as, as humanity. To place it simply on the backs of one section or one people or just to say this is uh, an American sin is incorrect. And that's all that John Marcourt is trying to do here. Look, put it in context. Put it in, let's contextualize these things because the left love to use that term. Let's, con let's contextualize the institution of slavery. Um, and this is what he's doing by saying this thing is bigger uh, yes, it's horrible, but it's still ongoing. So let's really think about this in larger terms, not just focusing because of, of a political agenda on a particular period in a particular place. Um, and that's why that piece is important, uh, because, of that, because of that view. Um, uh, so... This is an important part of this reconciliationist message. He says, I mean, John says here, um, with all this in mind, it certainly be evident to any thoughtful individual that slavery is not merely a simple black and white issue, which is unique to America in general, in the South in particular, but a problem that has been an extremely long and complex history, with, with, that has had an extremely long, long and complex history, which has, during one era or another, brutally touched every nation on earth in some manner brutally touched every nation on earth. I mean, he's, he's pointing out how bad this is. Sadly, this is not the case, he says, as such facts do not fit well into the current agendas and run counter to today's dictates of political correctness. The basic myth that the noble North only went to war to end the curse of slavery while those in the South rose up in mass to defend the evil institution has been repeated so often by so many historians, the media, and self-serving politicians that it has now become accepted in toto by a majority of the public. Even the secondary myth that Lincoln's proclamation of 1862 freed all the slaves in America with the sweep of his pen has become historic dogma. This in spite of the fact that a simple reading of the so-called emancipation document would reveal that Lincoln's 100-day order did not apply to any of the slave states still in the Union, namely Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, and Missouri. Moreover, the proclamation specifically excluded both the areas of Louisiana and Virginia, then under control of the Union Army as well as all of the Virginia counties that would later become the unconstitutionally created state of West Virginia. In Lincoln's own words, all the areas he so delineated were to be left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. So, um, again, he, he puts all this within context. Um, now, that is to say, and of course, we look at Reconstruction and we look at what was going on there. And I wrote a piece, uh, Grant's Failed Presidency, which is a review of Phil Lee's great book, uh, U.S. Grant's Failed Presidency, um, published by Shotwell Press. This is not Ron Chernow's Grant. Uh, this is a look at Grant that is uh, not in line with the current fashionable trend to make Grant out to be better than he actually was. For a long time, Grant was buried near the bottom 
of presidential rankings because of the corruption. It wasn't just all the scandals, but it was Reconstruction itself that was seen as a violation of good government. The fact that Grant knew that the only way he would maintain power and the Republicans would maintain power is basically by abusing the South is well documented. The Republicans knew it. That's why they were disfranchising white voters in the South. That's why they were pushing so hard for black suffrage. They didn't care about any other minority groups, whether they were Indians or Chinese, as Lee points out, Phil Lee points out. It was only people that could help them win elections. And the Chinese weren't going to help them win elections, and the Indians weren't going to help them win elections, but former slaves were going to help them win elections. And people like Hiram Rose Revels eventually pointed this out. He said, look, I'm a Republican. Revels, who was the first African-American elected to the U.S. Senate, served in Mississippi, was originally from North Carolina, but served in Mississippi, said, look, I'm a Republican, but these Republicans really aren't for us. I mean, they're, they're for their own political and economic agenda to win and maintain power so they can, they can pursue their own economic agenda. This is the point of Reconstruction. And so it's actually Reconstruction itself that's the real stain on Grant's administration. Uh, and this is what Lee points out um, in this particular book. Uh, now, he uses the same sources as the revisionists. Now, some people, he doesn't use enough primary sources. Um, he uses many of the same sources as, as, as the revisionists. Um, and he says, look, this is simply not true, the fact that Lee, that uh, Grant wanted to protect minorities. Um, or it's true, it's, uh, he says, it's also, uh, Lee also argues that Grant had more to do with the economic corruption of the period than most realize. He gladly pursued both physical and economic reconstruction, promoted the interests of the Republican money class, and turned a blind eye to the rampant corruption among northern carpetbaggers and military-occupied Dixie. Um, but this is now seen as a good thing, right? But this, is, this, is, this is, makes an important point about history. The information about Grant hasn't changed. It's all out there. Everyone knows what Grant was doing, but the interpretation of that information has changed. The interpretation of the information. In fact, most history is simply that. It's interpretation. And what we do often is say, well, this interpretation is wrong, but my interpretation is correct. Uh, and I'm, I'm, look, I'm even saying that here. The, the interpretation of Grant being a success or a great president is incorrect. Uh, Grant was not a great president. Now, there's things, as I even mentioned in this piece, there's things that you could admire about Grant. I mean, Grant was not all bad and... and um, of course, uh, you know, a lot of people were going to be critical of, of Grant's treatment of Southerners in the war. That's why he was called the Butcher, um, or his own troops were in the war. That's why he was called the Butcher. Uh, but now there's an attempt to say that Grant was a better general than Lee. Um, this is something that's, that's being promoted quite actively among, uh, quote-unquote, Civil War buffs, to say that Grant was better than Lee. Um, so... You have this this reevaluation of Grant that's ongoing to say, well, I mean, all these Southerners are saying Lee was better and Grant was terrible. This is all just lost cause nonsense. Grant was really great. Grant was awesome. Grant was the man. So that's that's a revision, and it's okay for the people who have people in their in their mind that can be revised and be made better. We can, we can look at, okay, well, Grant had his faults, but look at all the great things he did. And that's okay with Grant, because he was supposedly on the right side of history. What about someone who's not on the right side of history, quote-unquote? What does that even mean, anyways? What about someone who people would say he's not on the right side of history? What about Strom Thurmond? The piece we ran on Wednesday, the last piece that we'll talk about for the week, by Michael Martin, it was presented at our summer school uh, this last July. It's Strom Thurmond, the Dixiecrats, and Southern Identity. And Michael Martin has, is attempting to uh, revisit Strom Thurmond and maybe contextualize Strom Thurmond or revise the interpretation of Strom Thurmond. He brings up some interesting points about Strom Thurmond. That fact that there's this pers perspective that Strom Thurmond uh, switched parties um, and uh, that uh, he was... This is where the segregationists really became Republicans. Uh, but Thurman had done it before that. I mean, Thurman had done it long before that uh, this, this supposed flip took place with, say, Barry Goldwater. Thurman had already moved beyond that. Uh, he was one of the first 
in the South to become a Republican. And of course, we know about Thurman's personal life, that he actually had a daughter with an African-American woman. Um, and so we know that Thurman was a complex individual and that he, he was open about it. I mean, he didn't hide it. Um, and of course, he was nominated for president by the Dixiecrats. But what, what uh, Michael Martin tries to do is say, well, look, is the, is the Dixiecrat movement all about race? Is it just about segregation? Or is there something else going on here? And he brings up the platform and he shows, no, wait, wait a second, look at this here. And he brings up the individuals who supported the Dixiecrats. People like Murray Rothbard, the New York, the Jewish New Yorker who supported the, uh, who supported the Dixiecrats because he thought uh, this was the best thing for uh, for real federalism and decentralization. People like Robert Lee Frost, the poet laureate of the United States, who supported the Dixiecrats, and Strom Thurmond. And there were many, many others. He says, look, I mean, this is, this is important to understand that this thing was not just, uh, or H.L. Mencken, this was not just a few uh, renegade Southerners. This thing had broad support. And of course, we know they didn't win much in the, in the 1948 election. They won only in, in a few of the southern states. But the fact is that they were there, and there was something deeper to their political movement than just simply segregation. And I think that's something that needs to be understood. And of course, Strom is a much more complex individual than just someone who was a segregationist. Uh, one of the pieces he wrote for us when he was doing some research and just said, this is something I can't really use in my paper, so I want to send it to you, is about Strom's exercise and dietary habits, which made him a, a, a very healthy individual. I mean, the guy lived to be over 100 years old. That's really impressive. Um, so Strom was certainly interested in, in health, mental health, physical health. And so he was a, an interesting character uh, in, in his own right. But uh, this is where you get, I mean, look, can we understand Strom Thurmond? How about Richard Russell? I mean, it's not just Strom Thurmond. There's all these other people out there that are Southerners in that period of time, the late 20th century, that perhaps deserve a closer look. And maybe there's something we can find that's valuable in their personality or in their some of the things they said. Look, Strom Thurmond was saying things, the South has been punished with poverty. Uh, we're going to try to do some things to help the Southern people. There was no Marshall Plan. I mean, he said this. There's no Marshall Plan for the South. The South was completely destroyed, but we never gave them a Marshall Plan. We destroyed Japan. We destroyed Germany. We rebuilt those countries with all kinds of federal dollars. We never did it with the South. In fact, not only did we not do it with the South, we punished the South. The South was punished with poverty. The South was punished essentially with reparations and having to pay for union pensions and having to pay for things they didn't have the money to pay for. Because there were mandates being made. You got to do this. You got to do this. Well, the South didn't have any money. Its capital was all gone. What were they supposed to do? That's reparations. And of course, it became an economic colony of the North. Uh, Phil Lee did a night a couple of weeks ago. We ran the piece by Phil Lee where he talked about how uh, economic reconstruction, what it did to the South, and how the South uh, was punished with by Northern business interests and became an economic colony. That's punishing the South. And this is all Strom Thurmond is pointing out. You've made the South your plaything. You've made it your conquered provinces. You've made it your state suicide theory. This has happened. And so shouldn't the South be an integral part of this? I mean, you want us to go fight your wars for you because the South was eager to do that in World War I and World War II and the Spanish-American War and the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Thurmond was also opposed to the Vietnam War often overlooked Thurman's opposition to American imperialism, uh, which is a valuable part of his political career. So there's all kinds of things about these individuals that we should be re-examining and not just always looking through the lens of race. You see, this is what the politically correct historians want you to do. Everything is about race. The founding is 1619 because it's all about race. But is America always just about race? Is there something else going on here? Is there something else valuable in these individuals that we should be looking at and exploring and saying, well, maybe there's maybe there's something to this. Should we not be pursuing a reconciliationist message instead of an antagonistic message? Should we not say positive things instead of negative things all the time? This is why, again, as I said, I think in last week's podcast, people have been, they turn off history now because it's all about the bad things, the terrible things. This is what people do. This is all the horrible. I mean, just by saying we're going to focus on 1619, you're, you're basically trying to rewrite 
the entire story of America. Everything is based on that. Everything is about that. It's not. That's myopic. That's self-centered. And it's not true. There was m- many other things going on. And I, I think I pointed out a couple of weeks ago and uh, wrote a piece about uh, the fact that you had the first pro-slavery treatise written in Massachusetts, and you had Southerners in South Carolina arming slaves in the Yemisi War. So, I mean, where's the complexity? Where is the discussion of this worldwide institution of slavery? It's not there. It's not there. And it won't be there because that doesn't fit the agenda. So, um, this is why reconciliation was there. This is why people started talking about it. It's why people started pursuing a reconciliation message because it actually helped the United States grow and prosper. When you create antagonism, as Boyd Cathy says, I mean, look, is the only solution we have left this now? I mean, if we're just going to be called all kinds of horrible names, this is what was happening in the 1850s. Well, I mean, what's left? You can't have you can't have a conversation if this is all you're doing. And it's the left that generally pushes this. So, um, think about that when you're when you're when you're reading these pieces or or going through these articles that come out. It seems like almost a daily basis. What we really should be doing is pushing a reconciliationist message and finding what's true and valuable in the South and finding what's important and finding uh, a way to say that you know there are some bad things that happened and we need to talk about those things. But yeah, but there's also good things too. Until next time. Good day.